Hello and good evening. Welcome to Austin Public Health's Vaccine Town Hall, where we'll discuss community questions and concerns related to COVID-19 vaccine safety, effectiveness, and distribution. I'm Larry Schooler. We appreciate you being with us here on ATXN and Facebook Live. As you no doubt know, we are in a very difficult time in the history of this COVID-19 pandemic. Just to give you a couple of uh, updated statistics, we have over 58,000 COVID-19 cases in the Austin Travis County area with some 607 people hospitalized, 105 in ICU. Our uh, new cases today are in the 700s. And so we are certainly in a very difficult period of this virus. And at the same time, there are plenty of signs of hope, including the emergence and the increasing availability of a vaccine. Tonight, we will endeavor to get to as many of your questions as possible. And uh, the best way to do that is via Facebook Live to uh, submit your question. And we'll do our best to get to the questions uh, that we can get to over the course of this broadcast. So we invite you to type those questions in and we will get as many of those questions answered as we possibly can. The goal of tonight really is to meet your particular needs for information about this critical phase of our fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Before I introduce our panelists, I just want to take this opportunity on behalf of my family and the entire community to thank all of them. They are working day and night uh, around the clock to try to get our community through this extraordinary public health crisis. And to each of them, I want to say thank you. Our panelists tonight include Stephanie Hayden, the director of Austin Public Health. Stephanie, good to see you. We also have Dr. Mark Escott, the interim Austin Travis County Health Authority. Dr. Escott, always a pleasure to see you as well. Dr. Uh, Dr. Charles Bell is with us. He's the vice chair of the Central Health Board of Managers. Dr. Bell, great to have you with us. And we also have Dr. Jason Reichenberg, the president of Ascension Medical Group Texas. Dr. Reichenberg, thank you very much for being part of our program tonight. Again, we are going to focus on your questions, the things you most want to understand. But before we do, we wanted to give our panelists a chance to give you some upfront information that may help answer some of the questions that you came to us uh, with tonight. So we're going to begin, if I could, with uh, Stephanie Hayden from Austin Public Health, who has some uh, overview information to provide for us as we get underway. Stephanie? Thank you very much. Um, I am going to share um, some slides that I've prepared with you. I think one of the things that we we definitely want to spend some time and, and talk about um, the importance of, you know, why you should receive the vaccine. But we want to be able to, um, I am sorry, we want to be able to also um, just kind of talk about um, our community vaccination strategy. With, with our strategy, okay. with our strategy, as you can see here on the slide, it's going to be so important for us to secure the healthcare infrastructure. I know most of you have um, really heard the emphasis and the importance of making sure that we are protecting those, um, you know, who are keeping us safe. And so the initial vaccines. Um, have been slated to go to a group called 1A. Um, that is your healthcare providers, um, your um, emergency uh, medical service providers, um, as well as our long-term care uh, facility residents and staff. In our community, we know that it is also important for us to um, focus on preventing um, severe disease and death. And so um, our overall strategy with everyone that needs to be served is we all must focus on the hardest hit communities um, in, our, in our areas. We wanna focus on communities of color, uh, people from low income and older adults. And so uh, we, we wanna be able to work our way through all of these categories, our essential workers, and then ultimately to prevent community spread. But we know it's important for us to be able to prioritize as a community. One of the things that is so important for us in our community is, is we always have to address the gaps in the vaccine administration. 
Um, we know that before uh, COVID um, arrived uh, a year or so ago, um, we had areas um, in Austin Travis County where there was no access, whether it's transportation, uh, healthcare access, et cetera. And so we need to be ready to focus on populations that are most disproportionately affected by severe disease. We want to uh, make sure that we're uh, meeting people where they are um, and being at a place where if there is, is lack of transportation, that they will have a location that's near them that, that, that they can access. But it's definitely important to have a large scale distribution site, but you also want to have some smaller sites um, that are in limited access areas from a healthcare provider. And definitely coordination is essential. Um, we all need our partners to work together so we can maximize our efforts. We have put together a plan. We would like to thank all of our, um, our partners that have, um, have, uh, have been meeting with us and working with us on this collaborative plan. And so we have a draft plan that is available. And so we are seeking feedback on that plan because it's going to be important for us to be a plan for our community. We want to be transparent um, and we want to make sure that as we're rolling the vaccine out, we are, are, are communicating and engaging folks that really may be reluctant to receive the vaccine. So that is going to be important for us to do. So far, you may, have be, may be aware um, that we have a wellness site that has received 1,300 doses. And as you can see, they've gone to uh, EMS um, as well as the fire department and um, started with Austin um, Police Department. Austin Public Health um, initially received a first allocation. Um, from there, we have provided it to 1A um, folks in that category. On Monday, we received a larger vaccine allocation. And so um, we are um, providing services. Um, our portal became um, it's, it was established today. And so you can go to austintexas.gov um, backslash COVID-19 and you can sign up um, to, to schedule uh, an appointment on that site. We wanna make sure that in our efforts, it's gonna be important for us to collaborate. And so not only just in Austin and Travis County, because across the region of, 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 of Texas, across the MSA and Texas, individuals have the opportunity that they can go to any provider they would like to and receive the vaccine. And the vaccine should be free of charge. And so we wanna work across um, the, the MSA so we're able to um, work with partners and be more collaborative. As a community, as we're getting ready, we know that everybody wants the vaccine. We, we know that. We're gonna say most people, um, because we still know that there are some, some hard to reach populations, there are vaccine hesitancy. And so we want to address that um, in our community um, engagement um, opportunities that we have. In closing, um, I want us to always be at a point to where um, we, whatever information we know we need and we want to receive from the public, it's going to be important for us to, um, it's going to be important for us to ask those questions and put ourselves in a position where we can receive as much information as we can. At this time, um, that ends my presentation and I will uh, turn back over to Mr. Schooler. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. More importantly, thank you for all the planning work and the coordination that you're doing with all of the different agencies that need to be associated with this critically important work. If you're just joining us, this is a vaccine town hall presented by Austin Public Health here on ATXN and Facebook Live. I'm Larry Schooler, joined by our panel, and I'm next going to turn to panelist Mark Escott, Dr. Mark Escott, the interim Austin Travis County Health Authority, Health Authority for some Opening thoughts, Dr. Escott, if you would. Thank you very much. Uh, again, 
I, I just want to reiterate the importance of understanding where we are uh, in terms of COVID-19. We are focusing efforts on getting vaccine out the door, but our community has to understand that we are not going to be able to vaccinate ourselves out of the current surge. The vaccine effort is going to help us avoid the next surge. It's going to help us save lives in the long term. It's going to help us return back to normal. But we have to balance that enthusiasm for vaccine with enthusiasm for protecting ourselves, our families, and our community. We have people working around the clock getting vaccine out as, as quickly as we can. Our, our state and federal government, our, our scientific community is working hard in producing and, and distributing vaccine. Uh, and we are fortunate because this has never happened in the history of, of humankind, that we've been able to identify a virus and within a year have tens of millions of vaccines out in, in the arms of Americans. Uh, we have to understand this process is going to take time. We are gonna learn lessons, we're going to improve, we are going to be able to scale up as as that vaccine distribution improves, and it will. But until then, we have to remember that we can protect ourselves by the things we've been talking about for the past 10 months, the masking, the distancing, the staying home if you can, keeping your students at home if, if you can, washing our hands, avoiding touching our faces. Uh, these things will help us immensely decrease the pressure on our hospitals, and it will allow us to focus more resources and more personnel on this vaccination effort. We can do it together and we look forward to hearing uh, the feedback from the community tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Escott. As a parent of two school-aged children and an extrovert, I will say that it hasn't been easy to follow all of the guidance uh, that, that people like you have given us, and yet we know how crucial it is. So we have uh, embraced our, our COVID lives, as it were, and we will uh, continue to do so. Again, for those who just joined us, this is a vaccine town hall from Austin Public Health. And our next panelist, whom I wanted to hear from with some introductory remarks, is Dr. Charles, Charles Bell of the Central Health Board of Managers. And, and Dr. Bell, of course, your agency is providing uh, much needed assistance to those folks who may be uninsured or underinsured uh, and still need support. And I think you may be muted on your end. Thanks, Larry. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, yes, yeah, Central Health is the Travis County Healthcare District, and uh, we provide healthcare services to the uninsured um, who are at or below 200% of federal poverty level. Uh, we provide these services through a number of providers uh, within the county, but our largest service provider being community care. And community care is our central health affiliated federally qualified health care center. Central health and community care are focused on the equitable uh, COVID-19 vaccine distribution. And we're working with Austin Public Health to ensure that those who are most vulnerable receive the vaccine as quickly as possible. Um, I echo all of the sentiments that uh, Dr. Escott and Stephanie Hayden have outlined to the public. It is important that we continue our vigilance in being um, in following the guidance of social distancing, wearing a mask, um, and staying uh, outside of, of really crowded uh, uh, areas. So, um, but again, um, the vaccine will be helpful. We want to make sure it gets to the appropriate people, uh, especially our population, which are those that are most disenfranchised. And uh, we look forward to working with our partners to make that happen. And I'm sure uh, all of the partners greatly appreciate your partnership. Thank you very much, Dr. Bell, for being here and for what Central Health is doing for the community. Last but most certainly not least is uh, Dr. Jason Reichenberg from Ascension Medical Group, Texas. Dr. Reichenberg, good to have you. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, my name is Jason Reichenberg. Um, I'm the president of Ascension Medical Group. Uh, Ascension Medical Group is a group of 900 providers uh, affiliated with a, a non-for-profit uh, multi-specialty group who sees primary care patients in addition to every specialty 
ranging from Waco, Texas, to Georgetown, Temple, Austin, and San Marcos. Uh, really, uh, I am a practicing dermatologist uh, and spent a lot of my time before this pandemic managing clinical quality work, patient satisfaction. But in the past nine months, I've spent the huge majority of my time working on COVID, whether that was testing or providing new treatments such as the monoclonal antibody, and most recently around COVID vaccination. So our group uh, serves a, a very uh, broad uh, range of patients. We have now delivered about um, 17,000 vaccines as of tonight, uh, between first and second dose. And that primarily went to uh, 1A category, uh, healthcare providers, community providers of healthcare or clinical services. And most recently now we've expanded into 1B where we started treating our patients within our medical group in addition to partnering with high risk exposure populations such as school um, teachers uh, in the 1B category. I'm really excited to be here today. I get a lot of questions from patients every day as they come into our clinics about safety, about pros and cons of vaccination, and I'm hoping to answer some of those questions today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Reichenberg. I have to confess that my walk this afternoon was with one of my doctors. So I sort of had my own vaccine town hall before tonight's town hall, but I'm sure that uh, there'll be a lot of questions I haven't even thought of that we'll get to uh, tonight. So again, if you're just joining us, this is a vaccine town hall from Austin Public Health. The focus now is on your questions. So please, if you are able to join us on uh, Facebook Live, please contribute those questions. And I'm just about to get underway with uh, some questions now. And uh, panelists, sometimes I'll know exactly which of you is best equipped to answer these. And sometimes I'll just ask you to jump in. So uh, please forgive me if I'm I'm not sure who should take which question. There are a number of questions that relate to the prioritization of uh, the, the giving of a vaccine. So this may be for Dr. Escott or Stephanie Hayden. Um, there was a question about where production workers and store clerks fall into prioritization. There was a question about incarcerated, where they may fit in the prioritization. Um, Stephanie or Mark, I don't know, Dr. Escott, I don't know if you're able to get into other specifics as to how your plans relate to groups of folks that weren't specifically enumerated in Stephanie's slide, but I think that's of interest to a number of our viewers. Yeah, I'm certainly happy to, to start answering that question. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of debate about how to prioritize vaccine uh, and what, what the state has done and what we support is is the prioritization of our healthcare workers because we have a limited resource and it's already stressed uh, and we're happy to, to see that we've made substantial progress in that 1a group of, of healthcare workers the next group the one these are really focused on those individuals who are at the highest risk for severe disease for hospitalization uh, for the need of icu care and and certainly at the highest risk for death uh, when we look even closer at the 1B group, we know that individuals over the age of 60 to 65 uh, are sharing the most substantial burden in terms of, of deaths and, and ICU stays. Uh, so that's really you know, been the focus is, is trying to get the vaccine quickly out as quickly as possible to those uh, who are impact <clears throat> being impacted by COVID-19 most severely that are also impacting our healthcare system so that we can stabilize that issue as we move in, into other priorities. But there are gonna be special populations. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll mention that uh, several weeks ago, I advocated uh, to, uh, to prioritize our state legislators uh, and their key staff. Uh, and the reason is because they're going to, they're part of government. They are, uh, e essential to the the workings of our of our state, and they only meet once uh, for six months every other year. Uh, and because of that gathering, which is going to be six months in duration, uh, and because of the high risk in that environment, uh, it is important that that we get that group vaccinated. Uh, you know, we've approached the state about providing an allocation specific for that, and we're we're still waiting on that. But there are going to be other groups as well, such as uh, those who are institutionalized 
in, in jails and prisons. Uh, so our, our hope is that we will be able to move on uh, to other groups uh, soon. But the challenge that we have with prioritization is uh, who do you choose? Is it, you know, is it uh, um, people, mobility uh, related folks, so bus drivers? Uh, is it teachers? Is it police officers? Is it construction workers, grocery store workers, wait staff? Uh, it, it's very difficult because there's a lot of differences within those groups as far as the risk is concerned. So what the state strategy has done is identify across the board, across the community, uh, those who are at the highest risk so we can get to them first. Thank you very much uh, for that. Not just the answer, but the thought that's gone into prioritization. I think that's very important. There are a number of questions that relate to distribution, as uh, I'm sure it doesn't surprise you. Um, and I'll try to kind of consolidate these a little bit. Um, there was a question about whether more vaccination hubs might open up in the city of Austin, and if so, when and where. Um, there's a question related to, you know, whether I would be able to get a vaccine at my uh, doctor's office if large public sites might be given priority. There are questions about bottlenecks in distribution, uh, and there are uh, there's a question about why distribution might be done in a decentralized way versus central hubs. So lots of questions just in terms of how the vaccine itself is going to get into people's uh, arms, so to speak. So uh, Stephanie, I'm not sure if that's a, a you question or Dr. Escott. Um, yes, I, I'll, I will take that question. Um, you know, one of the things that um, is important for us, and we've had conversations um, with folks in Travis County, but we've also had conversations uh, with folks in Hayes, um, Williams, um, and Bastrop. And so one of the key things in those, in those conversations is that being able to do this um, 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 in an, an alignment process where we are collaborating, however, um, um, communities want to make sure that they are receiving enough allocation for folks that are, are in, the, in those communities so they will have that access. We have partners um, you know, across the community. I mean, I want us to kind of think about when you get your flu vaccine. You know, some folks go to their primary care physician to get their flu vaccine. Um, I, myself, I don't go to my primary care physician um, the city of Austin um, works and, and has a provider that comes in to provide those flu vaccines. But my schedule was really weird this year, as you all may imagine, COVID-19 came on the scene. So I, I just ran up to the Walgreens uh, right up here by my home and I showed them my, you know, my insurance card and I got my vaccine that way. Um, and so that's my vaccine. Um, we want to make sure that those type of opportunities will continue um, to be in our community where, where folks will be able to um, have ease of access. If their physician is a provider, go to your physician. If you've gone to um, any of the other pharmacies, go to the pharmacies. But, but we want to make sure that we're receiving enough vaccine at all of those locations so folks will have a choice of where and that is the that is ideally the best way um, to do this and a, a quick question related to just getting uh, vaccinated um, someone asked if i live outside of this area outside of austin and travis county can I still get vaccinated from someone in Travis County? Yes, absolutely. Uh, anyone, any any person um, can go anywhere in the state of Texas, any city or county. So if you see portals, you know, we've seen portals that have popped up in other um, major cities. Um, and so they are accepting people from all over. And that's what the, the Texas Department of State Health Services has asked us all to do is to serve um, 
everyone, regardless of where they live. I had a specific question uh, that might be for Dr. Bell. Uh, the question was, uh, the shot is supposed to be free anywhere. Why should uninsured be prioritized before insured? And Dr. Bell, it may not be your question from the standpoint of a, of a policy matter, but uh, obviously central health does serve the, the uninsured. So I don't know, maybe Dr. Escott, if you wanted to, to take some of that and, and Dr. Bell, if you had something to contribute as well. Do you want to go first, Mark, or me? Yeah, I, I'm certainly happy to uh, to launch the answer to that. Uh, the answer is because this number one is the population has that has been most disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Uh, this is the population that does not have access to health care. This is the population that has diabetes and hypertension and obesity and heart disease that goes undiagnosed and unmanaged because they don't have the resources. Uh, that's why this community first. That's why the, the large sites right now to ensure that we can reach out to the community uh, first that has been so so hardly uh, hard hit uh, by, by COVID-19. And if I could interject, uh, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is it's not that they are uninsured that's moving them it's more that they have the conditions that qualify them for earlier vaccination absolutely uh, and dr bell from your vantage point anything that that you'd want to add in terms of the uninsured i'd just like to add um you know i agree with everything mark said but in addition to that these individuals tend not to have uh the ability for transportation uh, we have areas uh, out in eastern Travis County that uh, are not near a Walgreens uh, or a CVS or any of the conveniences that uh, individuals within the city uh, have to uh, get the vaccine. So uh, in many ways, Central Health and some of its clinics in distributing the vaccines in those areas this is their only opportunity or their only um, uh, availability of the vaccine to be delivered to them. Right. It's very easy to take for granted uh, what some of us have had in the way of a primary care physician and insurance that keeps the fees to that physician from our pockets uh, relatively low. Um, a couple of questions related to folks who are in that 1B category that Stephanie referenced in the presentation. Uh, one question is, <clears throat> there are many people who say they are 1B uh, who weren't able to get an appointment. They reference the, the issues with the online registration system. But there's also a question that says, if you're 1B under age 65 and have an underlying condition that is not one of the Department of State Health Services short list of specified conditions, what do you need to do to get an appointment for the vaccine? So the first question is related to someone who's 1B, not able to get an appointment for maybe some reason to do with the online site. The second one has to do with underlying conditions not directly specified by the state. So we, we, um, we were alerted um, earlier today. Um, did go, was active today. Um, the system does allow you to continue to register um, and, and, and set up your password, et cetera. Um, where the challenge was is um, the ability to schedule. Um, and so our staff are working on that. What, what I would suggest is, is um, for a person that may um, fall into the category that, that they feel that they do fit into the 1B, but their particular um, illness may have not been mentioned. Um, if you have a primary care provider, I think it would be good for you to have that conversation um, with them and share those concerns with them. If you are a person um, that is uninsured, um, my hope is, is that you can reach out to, um, um, to, to Central Health um, and, and, and talk with them um, through their medical assistance program and maybe be connected to a care site. Because ultimately, 
you definitely want to be connected to a medical home. I noticed that the University of Texas, where I uh, work, uh, on their web interface had kind of the list of conditions that I was accustomed to seeing It's the sort of qualifying conditions. And then they had another batch uh, kind of below it. And so um, it could be that, you know, folks uh, will start to see that additional tier or whatever you want to call it of conditions that could uh, qualify you in that uh, respect. Um, a couple of questions that I would classify as kind of uh, enforcement uh, related. One person asked, are providers checking eligibility for vaccines? And someone else said, who is in charge of enforcing vaccine stages? Uh, so I don't know if that's a Dr. Escott question or a, a Stephanie question. Well, I, I think one of the things that, um, and I know from, from Austin Public Health, um, you know, we encourage people to, to sign up um, definitely if you fit in the 1B criteria. Um, but what we will not do is, is we will not ask you, um, you know, to prove to us what that underlying health condition is. We're going to go by um, you being honest with us um, and, and telling us what that is. For example, you know, some people have severe allergies, and I know that is a part of the screening process that we ask people because we really want to know um, so we can prepare um, just in case um, you have an allergic reaction. And so for us um, as public health, we're definitely depending on folks to be honest and just let us know what that underlying health condition is. Uh, an honor system uh, at, at scale, as, as it were. Um, if I can uh, interrupt for a second, as a, uh, a vaccine provider in the community, um, this is a big challenge for us. Uh, with demand far exceeding supply, we're trying to figure out how to leverage the, the systems that we have. And one of the systems is if you're an established patient in an office, it's much easier for that office to determine if you are an appropriate candidate. And so um, I know that some offices are specifically using lists internally that they've created based on their criteria, at least to have a start to how to tier, how to distribute uh, vaccine. I think that as vaccine becomes more available, I think that these tiers also are gonna probably be easier to, to manage. And Larry, I'll, I'll just add one more item. And, uh, you know, we anticipated this difficulty, uh, you know, because vaccine wasn't going to be tied to a medical home, it was going to be difficult for us to uh, determine the underlying health conditions with certainty. Uh, so part of what we've done is really focused on age. Uh, age is easier to prove, and, uh, and it really is an independent risk factor for severe disease. So right now, Austin Public Health is focusing on individuals over the age of 60 or 65 years or, or older uh, because we know that they're at the highest risk. It's easy for us to, uh, to, to prove that. And, uh, you know, we, we can expect, uh, as we've just said, vaccine's going to continue to ramp up. There's a lot of frustration right now. People want to get their vaccine today, and, and, and we like that because we want people to be excited about it. But we have to realize that you know, four, five, six, eight weeks from now, we're not going to be talking about such restricted availability. Uh, we're going to have availability everywhere. And I, I say that with confidence because uh, we're looking at having a, a third vaccine approved uh, early next month, which is really going to inject uh, significant uh, uh, volumes of, of, of vaccine uh, into the United States. And, and we're hopeful that was going to help this, the situation out. It's interesting that you mentioned that age is easier to check. I've I've noticed in several friends of mine that they have, say, for example, let their facial or even head hair grow to an extent that I don't know exactly how old they are anymore, or they've aged more quickly than I thought. Um, but your point is well taken that age is certainly something that we can that we can document uh, in, a, in a birth certificate. Um, I had a couple of folks, we've been spending a lot of time talking about kind of uh, issues related to 
equitable distribution of the vaccine or equitable issuance of the vaccine. Um, there are a couple of questions related to people with insurance. Uh, so I wanted to, to cover that. Um, one of the questions uh, is uh, simply for insured people with high risk conditions, do you recommend they register with Austin Public Health or to wait for their primary care to offer the vaccine? We, we would prefer that you primary care physician to get the vaccine. Um, and as I stated earlier, there will be some, some pharmacy locations that will have it as well. So that could be um, an option for you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I think people are seeing these large sites and wondering, you know, is that is that where I need to head or should I visit with my uh, direct uh, doctor? Um, lots of questions coming in. And for those who have just joined us, we are in a vaccine town hall here on Austin, uh, Texas television and on Facebook Live. I'm Larry Schooler, joined tonight by Stephanie Hayden of Austin Public Health, Dr. Charles Bell of Central Health, Dr. Jason Reichenberg of Ascension, and Dr. Mark Escott of the Austin Travis County Health Authority. Uh, we appreciate very much all the questions that we've gotten so far. Please continue to post them and we will get to as many of them uh, as we can. Dr. Escott, you mentioned a little while ago uh, demand, or actually Dr. Reichenberg mentioned demand for exceeding supply. And um, there are questions as to why there is not enough vaccine available. And certainly that's been reported on a lot in the news media, but uh, from where you all sit, uh, why is there so much more demand for vaccine than there is supply? Well, I'll start by saying, again, we, we have tens of millions of vaccine available across the U.S. It is miraculous, really miraculous that we are even at this point of wouldn't, discussing mass distributions. Wouldn't it ordinarily have taken a couple of years to get to the point that we are here in the first year of, of this? At least a couple of years, you know, generally many years in order to uh, to create a new vaccine for a brand new virus. I tell you, this is a testament to the uh, our scientific community, our medical community, our our government, uh, in in the ability to uh, to really realign itself, to prioritize, and to to pre-manufacture millions of doses of vaccine, which is a brilliant strategy, so that we could get them out the door in mass quantities as soon as possible. And Dr. Uh, I, before you continue, I, I think it's it's useful to give the public, and maybe Dr. Reichenberg can chime in here as well, th the fact that everything has happened in record time is something that clearly excites you, it excites me as someone who wants to get the vaccine. It also worries others who think that corners have been cut in the quality assurance and quality control domains, and so I wonder what you would say to them. Well, I, I can jump in, uh, having done some uh, clinical research and addition to clinical work. Uh, when, when we look at the safety of a lot of these vaccines, we're talking about how many patients and how many days, months, or years those patients have had since that um, vaccine was given. And the great thing is, due to the enthusiasm of how many people have been willing to uh, be uh, trial subjects during the trial phase, we have you know, tens of thousands uh, of, of patients now to give us confidence on, on the safety of these medications. I will say that based on the, the safety data we already have, this vaccine is uh, safer than a lot of medications that I use routinely. Uh, I was comparing the vaccine to some of the antibiotics I give, uh, some of uh, the psychiatric drugs that are given, and those are drugs that people use routinely. Uh, this is a uh, a very safe medication considering how many millions of doses have been given nationally and internationally now. I, I, I we have not been seeing big signals. Uh, in fact, I think that uh, we're, we're getting more comfortable that this vaccine is, is a very safe option. The fact that all the healthcare workers have lined up to come to get it, uh, I think also is a testament to the confidence that the healthcare community has in the safety of the vaccine. 
There's an interesting question here that I hadn't thought about, which is how come vaccine sites are indoors and wouldn't it be safer outdoors for social distancing? Any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take that. There, there are some vaccine sites that are outdoors. Uh, there, there was a, a drive-through vaccine effort here locally uh, where nearly a thousand people were, were vaccinated on Saturday. Uh, we're going to see a combination of efforts uh, indoors and drive-through. Uh, there's, you know, the indoor clinics have a screening process to ensure that nobody's symptomatic. Masks are required. Distancing is required. Uh, so every site that I've seen has thoroughly worked through the safety measures to ensure that if they were having an indoor vaccination program, that that it could be done safely. There's been a lot of reporting. I know this doesn't apply to all the vaccines, but I know certain of the vaccines require uh, ultra cold storage. And so there's a question that's been posed um, about how vaccines are being stored. And um, when will someone get a vaccine, this person says, if they have the facility? I assume if a facility has been identified, how long does it take to then distribute the vaccine? But, but the question about storage, I think, is one that would help uh, reassure the public for whoever would like to address that. Um, I, I can address um, the storage of the vaccine be a provider of the vaccine, you must have the facilities to safely store the vaccine, monitor the temperature um, around the clock, um, have, a, have some type of process that alerts you if, if the temperature um, drops below the desired. Um. Now, one of the things is, is with, with Pfizer, um, Pfizer is the one that does require the extra, extra um, cold um, temperature. Um, Moderna um, can be kept at a, at a higher temperature. But with both of those, um, you know, once you um, receive them, you know, as a provider, you can keep them in your, in your regular um, um, refrigerator and then continue to provide the vaccine. So you have a number of days that you can go ahead and administer those um, at your at your kind of you know regular vaccine um, storage level. Now, you have um, not a vaccine that that can store Pfizer, uh, so we receive Moderna, um, and so um, it, it's uh, equivalent to um, a system for uh, varicella, which is uh, a vaccine for chicken pox. And so um, that has to be kept at a very cold temperature as well. And so the Moderna, we're able to keep that um, at that similar temperature. I think that that explains why you're gonna see that the Pfizer is gonna be more and more distributed at uh, large facilities like a hospital uh, or a laboratory that, that has these cold chain facilities where um, uh, smaller facilities, a primary care office, et cetera, is routinely going to get Moderna or some of the newer vaccines that require even less cold storage. Uh, so the good news is that the, as we continue on in the, the vaccine history, uh, we're getting more and more options for different environments. There is a question, and if you're just joining us, this is a vaccine town hall for most in public health here on ATXN and Facebook Live. I'm Larry Schooler with Stephanie Hayden from Austin Public Health. Dr. Charles Bell from Central Health, Dr. Jason Reichenberg from Ascension Medical, and Dr. Mark Escott, the interim Austin Travis County Health Authority. Um, this might be a question for uh, Dr. Bell, uh, though I think this probably impacts a lot of you. Um, how do you expect people who have no email accounts to be able to navigate online registration processes with providers? And I, I mentioned Dr. Bell only because I would imagine that many uninsured folks uh, fall into that uh, category, but anybody uh, can can speak to that uh, particular accessibility challenge. Um, I'll say that um, initially, our community care population, as well as uh, providers in our network that provide um, services to the underserved, 
Um, we know that many of them are not connected electronically, uh, but based on the fact that we have a relationship with them, um, we have community health workers that do outreach to those individuals. Um, we're able to make contact with those individuals and provide them with the information that they need. Um, it's always a concern uh, when we are uh, looking at ways to uh, provide education and services to the population that we serve uh, that, you know, sending a text message or sending an email is not necessarily going to reach everyone. So uh, we have the available staff and who have the expertise to go out into those neighborhoods, into those areas and talk with individuals and give them the information and hopefully they pass it on. The, uh, um, what, one thing I would like to share is, is that um, to understand everyone does not have access to the internet. Um, and so um, we have some folks um, that will be, um, that individuals can give us a call and we will schedule their appointment. We will, um, put all of their information in the system um, as if they were online doing that themselves. So that is something that we provided um, to our community members. I know that's very much uh, appreciated. Um, there was a question related to transportation assistance. So I, I think I remember Dr. Bell mentioning the you know, scarcity of facilities in certain parts of our region. Uh, and sometimes if someone doesn't have a car, there could be difficulty actually getting where they need to go for a vaccine. So is, uh, is anybody able to speak to a system to assist with getting people to the site? Well, you know, uh, go ahead, stay. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's always important when you think about where your clinic location is gonna be. We know in Travis County, we have limited access to transportation. You wanna make sure that it is on a, a bus line um, and you don't want a bus line that is a mile away from where they may be trying to get to. You want it to be nearby. Um, and so it, that's why it's really good to, to be able to look at where you're planning, but make sure that it has um, accessible transportation, uh, public transportation. And in addition, uh, many times when we had um, individuals, especially in Eastern Travis County, where, you know, the bus lines are not as accessible as they are closer into East Austin, um, that we have set up arrangements with uh, car, car uh, services like uh, Austin uh, Public Ride or Austin Ride, I can't remember exactly the name, but, um, we set up services for those individuals to uh, be transported to clinics for their appointments. And I'm sure that we can avail ourselves uh, to do that again, if necessary for individuals that need to receive the vaccine. It is uh, not surprising, but still remarkable that so many of the equity challenges that we have faced both in this country and in this community have come back to you know pose a, a significant challenge to us here as we are in this critical uh, moment. Several other questions that I'm going to try and get to before we close here at the top of the hour. This is a vaccine town hall from Austin Public Health. Uh, we had a couple of questions um, that I thought uh, might be either for Dr. Reichenberg or maybe for uh, the policymakers. Uh, is Austin making an effort to vaccinate people of a single household? on the same day to reduce exposure or will the people in the same risk group get different days and times? And then there was a question, can two people who have been vaccinated stop social distancing in terms of public health guidelines? So uh, I'll, I'll try to, to start and then um, maybe everybody else can jump in. I would say that um, as our systems are getting more sophisticated and we're, we're getting better um, all the time. Uh, I think that there is an effort to try to vaccinate uh, groups. I think one, once we start expanding the uh, 
guidelines of who would fall into different groups, that'll also be easier. For example, if you have a 65 year old who's married to a 62 year old, one of them currently doesn't qualify and the other one does, um, it, it would be great from a public health standpoint to do both. And I think that there will be efforts continuing to do that. I definitely want to spend more time answering the second question is, do we need to continue to mask at this time? And I would say the answer is right now, yes. You are, and then you'll see this since many of the healthcare providers have been vaccinated and we're all still wearing masks. There's a few different reasons. So first of all, at the beginning of your vaccination period in the first few weeks, you are not fully immune. And unfortunately, I have seen several patients who got their first vaccine and unfortunately within the first week or two got exposed to COVID and then got COVID not from the vaccine, because that's a killed vaccine that, that does not have any risk, but because they unfortunately just got COVID. So very important to mask for that reason, because your immunity takes a while. The second thing is that this vaccine is extremely effective, but nothing is 100% in this world. So the vaccine trials were reduced between 90 and 95% the chance that you're going to end up with COVID during this period. But uh, that that uh, period was not it was not a hundred percent. We did have people in both study uh, sides who got COVID. The good answer is is that almost everybody who ended up with the vaccine who still got COVID got a much uh, more attenuated form. The third reason is because we still don't know if you can become a transmitter between person to person. So there's some confusion, and I want to make sure to repeat myself. The COVID vaccine is not a live vaccine, and you cannot, if you get the COVID shot, give anybody COVID. However, if I'm fully immune and I'm exposed to patient A who has COVID, and I'm holding that COVID now in my nose, and then I expose the patient B, I can transmit from person to person, even if I am not um, uh, able to get infected. And we're not sure if that's the case yet. There are some data uh, that makes us concerned about that. I hope that that's not the case so that we can stop in the near future, but I don't think we're there yet. And Dr. Escott, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we currently are in uh, what's called stage five, which uh, calls for uh, uh, avoiding gatherings uh, outside of, of your household uh, for not just higher risk individuals, but, uh, but all individuals. And um, I'm sure that there will need to be a number of changes to some of the indicators I mentioned at the top of the hour before you're confident enough to recommend a change in stage. That's right. Uh, right now, we have to be very protective. Uh, again, we can't vaccinate ourselves out of this surge. Uh, but as was just said, we're, we're hopeful that as we gather more data on uh, people who've been vaccinated, it will help us make better decisions about whether or not it may prevent infection. Uh, the study's endpoint was looking at whether or not people develop symptomatic disease. Uh, so that's the difference between um, the, you know, what we're talking about, you know, it, complete immunity, meaning you can't even get infected versus uh, not having a symptomatic disease. Uh, so we need to collect more data, but I too am hopeful that as we collect more data, it will give us more confidence that that it may also prevent infection. Until then, until we can, can you know, achieve uh, you know, significant vaccination towards herd immunity, uh, we're gonna be stuck with masking and, and distancing for a while. I don't know how many of you watch the game show Family Feud. My in-laws watch it every single evening. So now I have been watching it and they have that final speed round where you have to answer like five questions in 20 seconds. This is very complicated stuff, so I'm not going to ask any of you to answer five questions in 20 seconds, but I might make you answer two questions in 60 seconds, uh, just, so just be advised. There is a question, uh, if you get a first shot, are you automatically scheduled to get the second, or do you have to search all over again? So the, the individual, the group that offers you the first shot should schedule your second shot as well. Uh, in most circumstances, that scheduling will happen before you even leave uh, that location. Uh, that will certainly be the case uh, uh, for Austin Public Health. We will reach out uh, and, and offer you that, that second shot. Uh, there's also a, a national system uh, that uh, 
that people can sign up for. It's going to track any symptoms or side effects, and it's going to ask you when you do for a second shot, did you get your second shot today? Uh, so there, there are systems in place for that yet. And the final question I'll, I'll ask is, uh, my primary care physician says he will not be given giving shots, so can we get vaccinated through Austin Public Health? I'm assuming this person is an insured uh, patient. Yeah. So, the, the, you know, the answer is we want to focus the, the public health uh, efforts on those who, who don't have other options. Uh, if people sign up and they qualify, they're, they're going to get a get offered a spot when there's a spot available. Uh, again, uh, we are hopeful that other partners like HEB, uh, like CVS, Walgreens, Austin Regional Clinic, uh, and others, uh, in, including community care, will continue to receive vaccines so they can continue to offer. Again, my, my guess is that a month from now, we're going to be less concerned about uh, the restricted flow of vaccine, and we will see much more volumes, uh, much higher volumes uh, of vaccines sent out to the states. Well, it is at this point that I want to extend deepest thanks to Dr. Mark Escott, who just spoke there, the Interim Austin Trust Health Authority, Stephanie Hayden, the Director of Austin Public Health, Dr. Charles Bell, the Vice Chair of the Central Health Board of Managers, and Dr. Jason Reichenberg, the President of Ascension Medical Group, Texas. Uh, to the four of you, thank you not just for your time this evening and your thoughtful responses, but most importantly, for taking such good care of our community. We all really appreciate it. As we, as we close, I want to make sure that everyone is aware of the importance of visiting austintexas.gov forward slash COVID-19. At that page, you can not only uh, get information about signing up for a vaccine, a vaccination appointment through Austin Public Health, but they have uh, data dashboards, they have facility closures, uh, they have news updates, they have a self-assessment that you can take to determine whether you might have uh, COVID-19. So again, that website is austintexas.gov forward slash COVID-19. And just to reiterate, uh, according to the uh, dashboard indicators that I'm looking at, we had some 745 new cases today. We have uh, 177 uh, of our population in intensive care, 583 in the hospital. There are some 58,000 cases so far of COVID-19 in Travis County and regrettably 580 deaths. All of that is to say that the, the public health authorities have us in stage five of the uh, restrictions uh, and that calls for practicing good hygiene, staying home if you're sick, avoiding sick people, maintaining social distancing, wear facial coverings, avoid gatherings outside your household, avoid any non-essential travel, avoid dining and shopping except as essential, and for businesses, uh, contactless options only like curbside or delivery. Unfortunately, uh, we have to end on that note, but I, I certainly am ending this conversation uh, with a great deal of hope in our medical community and our public health community to help us uh, receive the vaccination that we obviously need to help us get through and confidence in our community that we can do what's necessary uh, for hopefully just a little while longer to make our way out of this pandemic and back to the lives that I know we want to resume. Again, on behalf of Austin Public Health, thank you very much for joining us for this vaccine town hall. For all of us at ATXN and the city of Austin, I'm Larry Schooler. Thank you and good night.